This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we take a look at the death of Vincent Van Gogh, long thought to be suicide, but as recent writings may suggest, may actually be murder. Excuse me? <laughs> what? We're gonna cover a murder on this show? Uh, no, but of a man who long thought to have taken his own life. I mean, he was a bit eccentric and had a history of bodily harm, so maybe people assumed it was suicide, but there are some things in here that, at least for me, yeah. are fairly convincing that it may be something a little bit more sinister. Well, I'm here for it. What you know about Go? What about, uh, you know, he's a Dutch guy, painted a lot, you know, very dreamy, cut off his ear. He did that uh, self-portrait. You know? Yeah. You did a selfie. All right, we're done here then, Case right? Closed. <laughs> Case closed. No, we got him. We got a murder okay, to talk right, about, all right, buddy. Okay. All right, season finale. Let's do it, baby. Let's get into it. Vincent Willem van Gogh was born on March 30th, 1853, in Zunder, Netherlands. He was the oldest surviving child of Theodorus van Gogh and Anna Carbentis. Vincent would eventually have five younger siblings, the one he would form the closest relationship with being his brother Theo. Despite his good grades, Vincent left secondary school before graduating. At age 16, he began his art career as an apprentice with Goupil and C, an international art dealer where his uncle was a partner. Vincent first worked for Goupil in The Hague, then in London, and finally in Paris, where he was dismissed from the company in 1876, two days after his 23rd birthday. Kind of a double-edged sword back then because it's neat that you can just jump into an apprenticeship at age 16. Be like, yeah, I'm probably gonna be a, a legend in the art field. I'll do that. You could still do that today though. I feel like people start apprenticeships quite young. But they don't really do, like at 16? Yeah, I remember applying for an apprenticeship at Warner Bros at 16. How'd that turn out? I didn't get it. Mm. So. I hope you're watching this now and know what you missed out on. Jack <laughs> Warner. <laughs> Jack. In 1881, after five years of wandering Europe and bouncing between dead-end jobs, such as lay preacher, Vincent moved back in with his parents, who worried about their son's lack of direction in life. Theo, who had also gone to work for the art dealer Goupil and C, but had risen through the ranks to become a manager, began sending his older jobless brother money. For the next few years, Vincent would move out for periods, but return to his parents' home. It's interesting because nowadays people, you know, people get to age like 24 and they're like, I just don't want to know, I don't know what I want to be in life. Well, it is kind of funny that he is this 19th century millennial just wandering around. Yeah. Not really sure what his purpose is. And if Vincent Van, this is, a, this is an aspirational tale for all you out there. If Vincent Van Gogh is going through this similar struggle, you know, you can make something of yourself. Just out there with his brush saying, I'll put this on something. You put it in front of me, I'll put it to it. That, I feel like you yeah. can word that better. Yeah, no, no, it's probably exactly what he said to people. I'll put this on Give something. Give me a you, job, I'll put this on something. I'll put this on something, you put it in front of me, I'll put it to it. In 1884, Vincent, now in his 30s, wanted to start paying Theo back for all the support he had given him over the years. Vincent began sending his paintings to Theo in Paris for him to sell. Unfortunately for all parties, Vincent's work was not what the people of Paris were looking for. I always wondered about this when it comes to famous artists. Obviously, it took them usually decades to find what made them famous. Wouldn't you say that the paintings, like their early drafts of when they really sucked, wouldn't those be worth more? Because it's like seeing the journey. I don't know if they're worth like, more, but they're probably worth a lot. Like a year one Van Gogh. Yeah. I feel like that, when you say it that way, it sounds like it should be expensive. It's a little, yeah, it, is a, it did send a little, whew. I didn't know he had a year one Van Gogh in his house. I didn't know he was doing that well. That's pretty good. It looks like shit, but you know. I think there's a lot of that out of there for uh, old Picasso. He's got a lot of early stuff out there. Oh, Pablo? Yeah, him. Oh, you're not talking the other Picasso. <laughs> not, not Ted Picasso. <laughs> Over the next five years, Vincent's life would appear to once again be mired by folly as he started a failed art collective and continued his nomadic habitation of Europe. During this period, however, the style now associated with Vincent began to take form. The tones used in his paintings began to lighten. He developed his characteristic style of using short brush strokes, and he moved to brighter, more colorful subjects, such as portraits, often self-portraits, and city scenes. Unfortunately for Vincent, the progress of his art happened during a time of declining mental health culminating in late 1888 when Vincent famously severed his own ear and wrapped it up as a present for a sex worker. The day after this eerie occurrence. Mm. You like that one? Mm. <laughs> oh. ah. Yeah, he liked it, I loved it too. 
Uh, cheers. Vincent was admitted to the hospital, where he stayed until early 1889. For the next few months, Vincent struggled with his mental health, eventually checking himself into a psychiatric hospital in May. During his one-year stay at the hospital, Vincent made some of his most famous masterpieces. In his first week there, he started painting the irises in the asylum's garden. While Vincent considered the paintings merely a study, irises is considered one of his most iconic pieces. The Starry Night, now one of the most famous paintings in the world, depicts the view from a window in the asylum, enhanced by Vincent's imagination. In January of 1890, Theo and his wife welcomed their newborn son, Vincent Willem van Gogh, into the world, named after the infant's uncle. Vincent sent them his famous painting, Almond Blossom, from the hospital as a gift for his new nephew. All told, while in the asylum, Vincent made about 150 paintings, and by 1890, his work was finally being exhibited and receiving positive reviews. I don't know if I agree with this narrative all the time where art needs to come from this like darker place of misery or maybe like turmoil yeah. within your head. You don't need to be troubled to make good art. It, it happens, but sure. I think, um, I think intense emotion or introspection can obviously fuel it. Yeah, like a, like, a, like a breakup or a death. Yeah. But it is weird that great art is often not appreciated when it comes out. And That's I don't true. know why that is. I mean, a lot of it is, you know. Well, maybe because, like, the artist's mind is more enhanced at that moment and the world is not ready for it yet, so they're ahead, they're ahead of the time. Be. That could be. After being released from the mental hospital in May, Vincent moved to Auvergerois, an area with other artists not far from Paris, which allowed for him to easily visit Theo's family in Paris. On one such visit in July, Theo told his brother he was considering starting his own business. This news greatly unsettled Vincent, who not only felt like a burden to his brother who was still supporting Vincent, but also worried about the impact of Theo taking this gamble on his own finances. After lunch on July 27, 1890, Vincent left the Raveau Inn where he was staying in Auvergne with his easel and painting supplies. It was a warm evening, so the innkeepers and guests were enjoying dinner outside after sunset when Vincent returned. He shuffled past without exchanging any words. He also notedly had none of the belongings he left with and had his jacket buttoned all the way up despite the heat. He clutched his abdomen and limped up the stairs to his room. Gustave Raveau, the owner of the inn, went to check on Vincent. The artist was curled up in his bed, and when Gustave asked him what was the matter, Vincent replied, quote, I wounded myself, end quote. He lifted his clothing to reveal a bullet hole under his ribs. That's sad. It is sad. One thing to note from this is it's a bit odd that he would take all of his painting supplies and his easel out only to then kill himself and then walk back with none of it. Like, why not just leave all that stuff in your apartment if that was what your plan was? Who knows how these things creep up on, on a person? That is true. Well, we're gonna get into it more in the theories. Okay. Theo arrived midday on the 28th to find Vincent in bed smoking. Vincent van Gogh died just after midnight, cradled by his brother after telling him, quote, I want to die like this, end quote. At just 37 years old, Vincent's life and career was over, leaving behind nearly 1,300 works of art on paper and more than 850 paintings. With no autopsy ever conducted, the exact location of the shooting never identified, and a five-hour period between the time he left the inn and when he returned unaccounted for, it's time to dive into some theories. The first and prevailing theory is that Vincent was a troubled genius who shot himself in a wheat field. According to Adeline Raveau, the then 13-year-old daughter of the inn owner Gustav, quote, Vincent had gone toward the wheat field where he had painted before. During the afternoon, as my father understood it, Vincent shot himself and fainted. The coolness of the night revived him. On all fours, he looked for the gun to finish himself off, but he could not find it. Then Vincent got up and climbed down the hillside to return to our house, end quote. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, I could see that. Oftentimes when people commit suicide, the weapon's right there, the means is right there, there's usually a note. It's very odd to be like, shoot myself, now let's go hide this gun. Yeah. I mean, it's a wheat field, you know? I don't know how dense those are, but... Unless he tossed the gun, which maybe he did. At the same time, how thorough of a search do you think he's doing if he is currently bleeding out? Well, you'll also come to find that no one else could find the gun either. Interesting. Now do you understand why I think that's so weird? Now I understand, Ryan.
Perhaps no one was more adamant about this theory than Vincent himself. Witnesses recalled Vincent saying, quote, I wounded myself in the fields. I shot myself with a revolver there, end quote. He was emphatic saying, quote, do not accuse anyone. It is I who wanted to kill myself, end quote. Witnesses did say, however, that Vincent appeared confused as he lay dying, replying to the police's question of, did you intend to commit suicide with, quote, I think so, end quote. Vincent had also in the past morbidly joked about suicide. He once told Theo he would, quote, cease to be, end quote, if he ever felt that he had become a burden or nuisance to his brother. Could his fear of complicating his soon-to-be unemployed brother's life have driven him to kill himself one hot afternoon? While this story is the one Vincent seemingly wanted the world to hear, there are some glaring issues with it. For one, Vincent was shot in the abdomen below his ribs, which is an odd position to take if he had been aiming for his heart. Additionally, the fact that the bullet did not exit Vincent's body suggests there was some distance between Vincent and the gun, more distance than Vincent could have achieved on his own. It's also suspicious that Vincent allegedly dropped the gun so far out of reach that when he came to, he couldn't find it to finish the job. What's more, if he had actually passed out for hours after shooting himself, his wound would have been much bloodier than it was when he returned to the inn. So if he did shoot himself, it would have been it would Larger? Been, yeah, because it had been so much time till when he got to the inn. It suggests that it happened sooner than he said it did, or like he watched. Oh, himself. negating his theory that he fell asleep, woke back up, came to the inn. It would have been so much bigger. Yeah, so they're saying like he probably got shot right away, then walked to the inn. Which would also explain then why he carried out his art supplies because he didn't go, oh yeah, getting shots in the plans today. Right. So, you know, it makes sense. Okay. Apart from the hard to explain ballistics, no one knows where Vincent would have obtained the gun. Revolvers were very rare in Auvers at the time, and no one would admit to selling or lending Vincent a gun. The next day, no one was able to find a gun where Vincent purportedly did the deed. All of Vincent's painting gear too seemed to have vanished. All his painting gear? Yes, from where he left it in the fields. Mm. So no gun, none of the paint stuff that he walked out with. Yeah. All the other stuff that I just mentioned. Do you think someone was aware that this was Vinny's stuff and was like, I'll get a pretty penny for this? I feel like we would have seen it by now. I mean, frankly, people at BuzzFeed steal lunches out of the fridges all the time. You don't think someone was just like, hey, free stuff. True. Someone did steal some of the stuff from our set. Yeah. Some of we our, lose stuff from around here all the from time. From our set, our precious props. You think we don't notice that? Timmy's, Coworkers? Timmy's ball is gone. Yeah, this is, this is, this a, is, this this is, is a, a fake. This is a, a sham. This is a fake ball. This isn't Timmy's. Someone stole Timmy's ball. What if Timmy came back and took it? I thought about that, but I don't think so. You did think about that. In addition to the questions the physical evidence raises, Vincent was a religious man who condemned suicide, calling it wicked and a demonstration of moral cowardice. At one point prior to his death, he even said, quote, I really do not think I am a man with such inclinations, end quote. Anytime he did have thoughts of suicide, it was always by way of drowning, saying, quote, I can understand people drowning themselves, end quote. Suicide is wrong. I do not understand it. It'd be pretty baller to drown. <laughs> it's just a weird thing to just tack on as a button at the end of that. Yeah, because drowning arguably seems like the more maybe painful. worst. But why is it more morally I've, sound? I've heard that it is agony. Oh God, did you really just sneak a prestige quote into him? I don't know. Theo also found no evidence that Vincent was planning on killing himself, finding no suicide note, but instead drafts of letters on his desk that he surely didn't want anyone to read. With so many loose ends in the suicide theory, it's time to look at another hypothesis, this one posited by biographer Stephen Nafa and Gregory White Smith. Nafa and Smith suggest Vincent was shot by some local boys and that Vincent protected their identities. To begin, it's worth going back to get a better picture of what life was like for Vincent in Auvers. He was known to be quite eccentric and when he would approach people in the street to ask if they would sit for him, most people retreated. His appearance didn't help matters with wild hair, ratty clothes, and you know, a missing ear. As is often the case, the worst bullies were the teenage boys. They would pretend to be nice to the artist to gain his trust, then pull pranks on him, like throwing salt in his coffee, rubbing chili pepper on a dry paintbrush Vincent tended to suck, and putting a snake in his box of painting supplies. Why are these boys the way they are? Sick pranks, dude. What? The snake bit the artist. <laughs> <laughs> we nailed him, bro, right? Yeah! Yeah! 
<laughs> what a nerd. God, I'd love to just transport them here and be like, hey, you know that guy who uh, you put a funny snake in his mailbox? You know, you put some salt in his coffee? He's in the museum. He's, he's the museum that you're standing in he's front of the now. museum. I can't believe boys would be that mean to a funny old man. I can believe it. Teenage boys are the worst. I remember being obnoxious as a teen. Yeah. It's inevitable. If you're pranking a stranger, I find it not as funny. It's just mean. It, it's just mean. It's just mean. And this is mean. One of the boys who would tease Vincent was Rene Secreta, who said, quote, our favorite game was making him angry, which was easy, end quote. <laughs> our favorite game was making him angry, which was easy. <laughs> what a little stinker. What a little piece of shit. <laughs> Oh, look how red his face is getting. Ho, 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 ho. Look at the tears. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. What a little brat. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Renee's older brother, Gaston, was an aspiring artist who liked to hear Vincent's tales of the Parisian art world. Vincent figured Renee was just something he had to endure in order to have a friendship with Gaston. Rene, unlike his brother, had no interest in art, instead enjoying fishing and hunting. After seeing Buffalo Bill's Wild West show in Paris, Rene came back to Auvers with a full outfit of Western clothes, complete with fringe coat, cowboy boots, and added a 380 caliber pistol. Vincent started calling Rene Buffalo Pill, a mispronunciation of Buffalo Bill due to his accent, which only angered the boy more. I love it. I Thank love course. Vincent getting back at him. Cause I'm sure this guy just showed up and Van Gogh was just like, oh, Buffalo Pill. And everyone was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just said he's Buffalo Pill. And I was like, oh, he did it again. <laughs> Vincent does it again. And Renee's sitting there like, you shut up, shut up. And they're all like, blow off those pistols, Vince. Oh, what a burn. What? <laughs> I love that kid taking his hat off, slamming it on the ground, stomping on it. So to hear him get a little win in there. Yeah, a little prank war. I love it. It's good. It makes me happy. In their book, Van Gogh the Life, authors Nafa and Smith speculate that the Secreta boys quarreled with Vincent around a farmyard on Boucher Road. They may have accidentally fired the gun, striking Vincent in his abdomen. Vincent then stumbled back towards the inn where he covered for the boys. The boys, in shock at what they had done, may have collected Vincent's belongings and fled the scene, destroying what evidence might remain. It seems plausible, one, because he's a sweet man. Yes. And clearly he put up with this bullying for a long time. So they're being very cruel to him and he's still just kind of like, hey, that's just he, how it goes. He had, Terrible a kids. He, had, he had a relationship with one of the brothers. And the that's other the other thing. If he's close with Gaston, then maybe he doesn't want to point fingers to Rene. Yeah, because it's going to ruin their life. It's, yeah, it would be a devastating thing. Yeah, I, I buy it. I think I, could, I think I could get behind this. The theory is supported by the fact that multiple witnesses saw Vincent leave the inn and head towards the hamlet of Chapinval, and not towards the fields where he claimed he'd been painting. That road leads to a spot in Oise where Rene enjoyed fishing. It's possible Rene and his brother met Vincent on their way back from Oise, went to a nearby farmyard, and then the boys accidentally shot the artist. That would also make it easier for Vincent to get back to the inn with a bullet in his stomach, as opposed to a steep mile long trek back from the wheat fields. This theory would explain a lot of things the suicide story does not, such as the odd entry point of the bullet, the lack of suicide note, why Vincent took his painting equipment to kill himself, why all that gear and the gun could not be found, and why he didn't shoot himself in the head. They don't think that Rene would have been so upset about the, clou about the, the cowboy clown. About the puffalo pill. <laughs> yeah, that he would. I would hope not. See, that, and that makes this story get a different kind of turn. Yeah. Still sweet of him to cover, but I really, really don't want to accept the fact that maybe Rene did shoot him on purpose. In the wake of the shooting, Rene, Gaston, and their father left town. When they returned, Rene, who rarely traveled anywhere without his pistol, no longer had the gun. When asked about it decades later, Rene said Vincent stole it from him. In the 1930s, as Vincent's work was beginning to gain notoriety, townspeople told an art historian that young boys shot Vincent on accident and that Vincent protected their identities for fear they'd be accused of murder. Still, largely due to Irving Stone's 1934 novelization of Vincent's life and death and the 1956 movie that followed, the idea of Vincent van Gogh being a tortured genius who took his own life crystallized in the public consciousness. 
In a story that may feel familiar for those of us in our 20s and 30s, Vincent spent much of his life looking for a purpose, trying to find a path that could at once fulfill himself while also bringing joy to others. What he didn't know at the time of his death was that his work would be beloved by generations, inspiring countless others to pursue their life's true purpose. What he did know at the time of his death was how that fateful bullet found a home inside his abdomen. But as for the rest of us, that truth will remain unsolved. Well, that's a lovely little story. I gotta be honest, I didn't think that the alternative would be a little bit heartwarming. Yeah, I would say so. It, would, it definitely paints a different image completely of him in my mind, because I, like most of the public, did think he was a tortured genius who took yeah. his own life. Yeah. But this paints him as a very empathetic, understanding man. The underlying theme being human kindness. Yeah, not bad. It's a good thing to try. Take it for a whirl. Yeah, it's definitely a good way to end the season. Oh. <laughs> See, we don't agree on anything, but right now uh, we, we hate agree. Each other. We, we like this moment. Yeah, so you all take a cue from this, and we're all going to be golden.